Good evening, and a warm welcome to you here from the Spokane Valley Adventist Church in Spokane Valley, Washington. So thrilled that you could be with us this evening. I'm Teddy Shoup, the lead pastor here, and give you a warm welcome. Hopefully you've been enjoying so far the presentations for these 40 days of preaching, teaching, and praying. And this evening we have another presenter and somebody that I'd like to introduce you to. His name is Pastor Derek L. Lane, and he is the principal owner of the Lane Consulting Group, an agency that provides workshops, training, and consulting services for community and faith-based organizations throughout the United States. Some of his clients include World Vision, the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Chamber of Commerce, and the Christian Community Development Association. Pastor Derek has launched over a dozen nonprofit agencies and secured over $20 million in grants and resources over the past 30 years as an executive director, board president, consultant, and pastor. He is an ordained minister and graduate of Oakwood University, Mississippi State University, and Nelly, the Nonprofit Executive Leadership Institute. In 2013, he was selected as a peer reviewer for the Standards of Excellence Institute and currently serves as pastor of the Mount Moriah Seventh-day Adventist Church in Phoenix City, Alabama. He is the father of three daughters and one son, and he is the husband of one wife as well. And we're just so thankful to have him here this evening. Before he shares with us, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together to listen to your word through your servant. And I just pray that you would bless Pastor Derek Lane as he shares with us this evening. Continue to fill him with your spirit and draw us all closer to Jesus is our prayer in his name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. It is so good to be with you this evening, and we are so appreciative of the invitation to come and to share. Uh, we're thankful for Guardrails Media and for the hard work of uh, Mr. Rupert Salmon and all of the others who are working with him as well. Um, we're excited about the opportunity to be here. I think this is our third or fourth time uh, getting a chance to come out here to the beautiful state of Washington. The first few times we were on the west side in Seattle, and uh, we were here in Spokane a few months ago, and glad to be back. Um, <clears throat> this is our first time actually getting a chance to speak. I want to also thank the pastor of this wonderful church uh, for the um, kind um, graciousness uh, to be able to share his pulpit. We appreciate that very much. Uh, again, I thank you for the invitation. You know, I'm a, I'm a Southern preacher. And, and one of the ways that you guys can help me feel welcome, um, we have a tradition in our church in, in Phoenix City and in the South in general. Um, in my congregations, when we share and we preach or, or talk, um, we, we, we generally have this thing we call call and response. Huh? Y'all heard about that? Oh, amen. Okay. I was like, say, say no more. Okay. All right. So, so a, a way that you can help me feel welcome, amen, uh, is, is help the preacher along. Pray for me. And, uh, and, and we're going to let the church move, move on. Amen. I, I want to, to share a word with you from the Gospel of Mark. From Mark, the third chapter. Mark chapter 3. 
And we're going to read a few verses from there. If you do have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn there with me. And Mark chapter 3, and we'll just look at the first five verses. Mark chapter 3, and beginning at verse number 1. The Bible says, And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. His hand was restored whole as the other. The title of our message tonight is Withered Hands. Withered Hands. Now let's pray again. Lord, we thank you so much again for all you've done. And we pray that you would be with us now as we enter into your word. Thank you for uh, this opportunity to share and be with us as we seek you and your direction for our lives. In Jesus' name, let all of God's people say, amen, amen. So Mark chapter 3 and verse number 1, I want to read that again. It says that he entered again into the what, everyone? into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a what? A withered hand. Now, I, the, the, the thing I like, I like, a, I like this man. We hadn't even gotten into the story yet, and, but it just reminds me that we don't have to be perfect to come to church. He had a debilitating condition, but it didn't stop him. The plot hasn't even been developed yet, but I like this guy already. We're still at the credits. We're still introducing the characters in the story. But already your heart is drawn to this guy. We, we, we never get his name. We're, we're, we're never, we don't know his condition. We don't know anything about his family. The only thing we know is that in spite of his issues, in spite of his challenges, in spite of his drawbacks, he still comes to church. If he didn't do anything else, it ought to be an encouragement to every one of us. Think about the excuses we make for not assembling ourselves together, right? Y'all don't, don't be quiet on me now. You know, you know the reasons we get. It's too hot. It's too, well, not up here, right? It's too cold. The church isn't friendly. I don't like the people. It's too far from home. The pastor doesn't preach it the way I like to hear it. Huh? You know the excuses. Oh, I don't like the service. It's too quiet. It's too loud. It's too long. We've got all kinds of reasons for not going to church. But I like this man already. He has a condition, no doubt, that he is ashamed of. He has a condition that is very obvious to those around him. He has a debilitating norm, abnormality that doesn't allow him to have the mobility of others. And it affects his social life. It affects his mental health. It affects perhaps even his job prospects. It prevents him from doing a lot of things he wants to do, but it doesn't stop him from coming to church. He doesn't care what people think. He is not concerned with how it looks. He's gotten used to the stares, the, the side glances, the pointing fingers, the inquisitive questions. And so if we call ourselves a child of God, why would, he allow him, why would God allow him to remain in that condition? Why does he even bother coming to church if serving God keeps him in the condition that he's in? Well, I'm glad, glad, God, I'm glad that God is not like us, aren't you? 
I'm glad that this man didn't get discouraged. I'm glad he didn't get sidetracked. I'm glad he didn't listen to the haters and naysayers and prognosticators. He ignored the chatter. He closed his ear to the noise. And on Sabbath morning, he marched himself to church. What do you say? Like that man, you may have some things in your life that you too may be embarrassed about. You may have some physical, mental, or emotional setbacks. But don't let that stop you from coming to church. Don't let that, don't allow your issues and your problems and your drama to keep you from the house of worship. A part of the blessing of worship is just showing up. You may have a withered hand, but you also have a willing heart and an ear waiting to hear a word from the Lord. And we cannot allow people or circumstances or shortcomings to keep us from coming to the master. What do you say? Really, when you think about it, the fact of the matter is that we all have withered hands, right? We all have things in our lives that we are ashamed of, that we may be embarrassed about. We have stuff that we like to keep or hide from others. We, in essence, all have withered hands. In verse number two, it says, And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. Everybody that comes to church isn't coming for the right reason, right? Notice what the text says. It says, they came to see if Jesus would violate their man-made rules about proper Sabbath keeping, right? They came to see if he would observe the protocols of worship. They, They came to see if he would maintain the tradition and customs of worship. You see, in these two verses, we are introduced really to two classes of worshipers. One was motivated by a desire to worship, and the other was motivated by a desire to accuse. One was motivated by a desire to find fault, while the other was motivated by a desire to find truth. One was looking to God, the other group were looking at people. And can I drop a word right here? It's not up to us to figure out what other people's motivation is. Isn't that right? We we can't read hearts and minds. Only Jesus can do that. In fact, the only reason we know about this, their sinister thinking is because the Spirit of God had revealed it to Jesus himself. So we can't get caught up in trying to figure out why people do what they do. Stop trying to set ourselves up as some kind of spiritual thought police. We don't, we don't have any here, right? Amen. All right, don't look around, all right? Trying to figure out who's breaking the Sabbath, who's not holding up the standards, who's dishonoring the house of God by what they do, what they say, what they wear, right? God hasn't appointed anyone to that office. So stop a, a focusing our attention on people with withered hands because guess what? We all have them. We all have them. And what's so mind-boggling about this story is the fact that the Pharisees weren't trying to find fault with the man with the withered hand. They were actually trying to find fault with Jesus. That's powerful. Jesus, the one is the creator of the earth, is the one that they were trying to find fault with. In fact, um, this quote says, the Pharisees watched him eager to see what he would do. The Savior well knew that in healing on the Sabbath, he would be regarded as a transgressor. But he did not do what? Hesitate to do what? To break down the wall of traditional requirements that barricaded the Sabbath. You see, there are some church folk like the Pharisees of old that are more anxious to maintain traditions and customs than they are to see folk set free. Come on now. There are some that are so careful about guarding the traditions and rules of law that it gets in the way of them having healthy relationships with members with withered hands. These Pharisees, they were in such a tizzy and uproar about protecting the Sabbath that they failed to recognize the Lord of the Sabbath when he showed up to church. 
So isn't that interesting? How are you going to accuse Jesus, right, the creator of the Sabbath, of breaking his own commandment? <laughs> How are you going to be so self-righteous and zealous of the law that you're willing to deny someone a blessing of deliverance because you consider healing on the Sabbath work? How are you going to put chains on God when he is about to remove the chains of this man and be set free? Notice what verse 3 says again. It says, and, when, and he saith unto the man which had the withered hand. What did he say? What does the text say? It says, stand what? Stand forth. Right? Jesus told the man to stand forth. And so if you want to learn how to deal with Pharisees, you've got to do it the way Jesus did it. Did you, did you notice what Jesus said again? He said to the man which had the withered hand, do what? Stand forth. So, so, so Jesus ignored the Pharisees. Jesus ignored the naysayers. Jesus ignored the prognosticators and those who were trying to find fault. What did Jesus do? He spoke to the hand. <laughs> Come on now. So, 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 so don't waste your time arguing with folk about what's proper and what's not. Do what Jesus did and speak to the hand. Don't get drawn into debates about things on which the scriptures are silent or of what's appropriate and what's not. Do what Jesus did and speak to the hand. Don't focus on the accusers. Focus on those who need to be delivered and speak to the hand. Somebody say, speak to the hand. <laughs> Come on now. Minister and take time with those with withered hands, those that are in bondage, those that seek deliverance, those that need healing, those that need to hear a word from the Lord. Speak to the hand. I like verse 4. Verse 4 says, and he said, and he saith unto them, this is before the healing, right? He saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But what was their response? It says they held their peace. Now, I know you're probably asking the same question I did. Why did they not respond? Why did they not say anything? Well, they, they, I'm glad you asked. They, they held their peace because they were too stubborn to acknowledge their mixed-up priorities, right? They, they were more concerned about what people believed instead of helping them belong. They were too proud to admit their love of being a standard-bearer than to be a heavy load-sharer. They were caught up in rules instead of relationships, religion instead of deliverance, commandments instead of compassion. They held their peace because they didn't want to be exposed for the hypocrites they truly were. And they were too proud and stubborn to admit their error. Every false religion teach, teaches its adherents to be careless of human needs sufferings and rights. Is that not right? But what does the gospel do? The gospel places a high value upon who? Upon humanity as what? As the purchase of the blood of Christ, and it teaches a tender regard for the wants and woes of man. Amen? And look at how twisted our thinking can be when our focus is on trying to force others to live up to our man-made standards of righteousness, right? I mean, look at verse 4 again. Verse 4 says, And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? He's speaking to those that were thinking evil in their hearts, right? To save life or to kill, but they held their peace. When he asked them, is it lawful to do good or do evil, to save life or to kill? He was talking about them, right? He was talking about their evil motivations that prompted the confrontation in the first place. You see, they knew that Jesus was a healer. They knew that he was a deliverer. They knew that he was a mind regulator, but, and they knew he could set the oppressed free. But they were so upset 
because he was about to do it on the Sabbath, that they agreed in their heart that rather than allow him to set someone free, that they would actually try to kill Jesus for breaking the Sabbath. Now, I, I'm trying to figure this out. So, so, so you're going you, you're gonna, to you're gonna plan murder on the Sabbath to keep someone else from breaking another commandment. I'm still grappling with that one, right? And, and that's the exact reason why Jesus t asked them, is it lawful to do good or do evil, to save life or to kill? Because he was comparing what he was about to do to what they wanted to do in their heart. He was reading their minds. He was comparing his goodness with their wickedness. He was comparing his healing power to do good with their evil desire to do harm. And he was calling them out for that. And the Bible said that in spite of them realizing that he had read their thoughts, in spite of them sensing the conviction that they were dealing with more than just a mortal man, they still hardened their hearts dug in and clung to the false idea of holiness. And the Bible says at the end of verse 4, they held their peace. They were unwilling to acknowledge the error of their ways, unwilling to admit their mixed-up priorities, unwilling to give up their position as guardians of the law and the traditions of men. Listen, folks, let's not be like those Pharisees. What do you say? Let, let's not get to the point in church where we try to impose our ideas and standards on others to the point that it, sur that, that it severs and disrupts relationships. Our picture and idea of what constitutes Christian conduct and behavior may not be what Jesus has in mind. Yes, God has standards, right? God does have rules, but we shouldn't get to the point where we lose our religion trying to share our version of it. Notice the next verse, and it's the only verse of its kind in the gospel. You won't find this verse anywhere else. That's verse 5. If you have it, you say amen. Let's take a look. Verse 5 says what, everybody? And when he had won what? When he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the what? The hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. I, I want to close with restoration, amen? I want to close with the gospel. I want to close with deliverance. I want to close with the good news. And I want to close by outlining a two-step process for deliverance. Is that all right? Because there are a lot of people that still come to church with withered hands. They may not be visible, they're physical abnormalities, but they have withered relationships, withered finances, withered emotions, um, withered down by guilt, hurt, shame, and defeat. And, and we come to church and try to tuck our withered condition away so others can't see it. You, you know how we do, right? And we, we've got, the, we've got the, the, you know, the, the way we hide it down pat. We put on the whole Sabbath smile, right? And, and the greeting, happy Sabbath, how are you, right? Like we know how to hide withered hands. We try to keep our condition to ourselves. It's our condition. It's our chain of bondage. We want to be free. We're just not sure we want to go through what it may take to bring about restoration. Well, I've got good news for you. For some of you, your deliverance may be on the way. Come on now. Now, but for others of you, you may want to step up to the process. Jesus gave a series of commands to this man that may also begin our road to healing. And it may be perhaps God has called you or one of us to come alongside and minister to the needs of someone else. And you want to know, what is this process? How can I come alongside my brothers and sisters and minister to them and the, at the point of their need? Here's the first step. Step one is stop trying to hide it. Right? Notice with verse 3. Verse 3, again, just, just to re recap what we have mentioned earlier. He said unto the man which had the withered hand, what did he say to him? 
What's the word Jesus, the command he gave? Stand forth, right? It's in the King James Version. And in essence, what Jesus was saying is just come clean. Stand forth. You see, before Jesus addressed his specific issue, he called him to come closer. Just as he was, withered hand and all. Jesus said, stand forth. Now, many of us want to be delivered the other way around, right? We, we want to take care of those, the, the withered hands and then come, right? We want to take care of those areas in our lives that were withered before we move close to Jesus. We want him to fix the stuff before we come to him, right? We want him to fix those broken places before we move forward with his word, before we come to him, before we hear his voice. Stand forth is a strange combination of words, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, you, you see the word stand, and normally that would go with stand up, right? And when you see the word forth, you think the word that should precede that would not stand forth, but what? Come forth, like he did to Lazarus. Strange combination. Why did Jesus tell this man, stand forth? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I got plenty of time, right? <laughs> All right. The word stand seems like it would match better with stand up, while the word forth sounds like it would match much better with come forth. So what does stand forth mean? It denotes both vertical and horizontal movement, right? God wants us to rise up, and he also wants us to change our location and come closer to him. Stand means elevation. Forth means a change in geography. It's cross-centered worship and living. In fact, when you think of the cross, I want you to think about this term, stand forth. The vertical beam is a symbol of our relationship with God, while the horizontal beam is a relationship that we have with one another. So when God says stand forth, he's in essence asking us to live out the very symbol of the cross. That's exactly what we have to experience to have deliverance. We have to rise above our circumstances, rise above the noise, rise above our preconditions, rise above um, what, what, what some psychologists call stinking thinking, <laughs> right? Rise above our thoughts and ideas and behaviors that have kept us in bondage. And we also have to move forth. We can't stay where we are. We have to get away from the crowd. We have to bring, out, bring him all of our brokenness, our withered lives, our twisted thinking, our unhealthy relationships, our ways of coping and handling things ourselves. We have to be willing to bring all of ourselves and all that we are before God. Jesus told the man, stand forth. That's step one. And then step two is in the same verse as well, in verse number five. Not only did he tell him to stand forth, but notice what he also asked him to do. He said in verse five, and when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved with the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, and what's the line there in verse five? Stretch forth thine what? Thine hand. In other words, Jesus was trying to tell the man, Stop trying to cover it up. If you want deliverance, you've got to come out of the shadows. You've got to be willing to acknowledge those things and those areas that are withering away at your connection with God. You've got to be willing to expose it for what it is. It may be a little embarrassing, it may be, but guess what? At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. All of us have issues. All of us have drama. All of us have things in our lives that, that we're ashamed of. We want God to change. But guess what? God can change it, but we have to be willing to give it to him. Jesus didn't make it easy for the man either. He called him out. He called him forth. And before that congregation, he asked him to expose the very thing that others knew he struggled with, but was still trying to hide. Isn't that how it is? 
Very often, the things we think we're hiding from others, we really can't, right? First of all, God knows and sees all. We can't hide it from him. And, and the very people we're trying to hide it from because we're embarrassed or ashamed of it, very often they already know. They, they just are, you know, um, too nice to be able to confront you about it. But, but it, it's a strange situation to be in. But I want to ask you in closing, are there some things in your life that are affecting your relationship with God that you're still trying to protect, you're still trying to hide? I want to say to you the same thing that Jesus said. He said, stand forth. Be willing to come clean with God. Let's humble ourselves before him and one another. What do you say? You know, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't hold back. He gave it all. He gave his life for you and I. He exposed himself to the onslaught of the enemy. And he even cried out, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But then he hung his head and died. And he died the death that we deserve, that we might have the life that he deserves. He took the death that is ours so that we might have the life which is his. I don't know about you today. I I appreciate Jesus for what he has done for me. Do you? I appreciate his death on the cross and and, and dying for, for my withered hands. And I hope by the grace of God that we too can live our lives in such a way that we can be honest and open and vulnerable before God and before one another so that God can facilitate healing in our own lives so that we can be in a position to to experience and to share life-changing events with others. What do you say? Let's bow our heads as we look to the Lord, shall we? Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to come before you and to learn, Lord, how not only to minister to ourselves, but to minister to those with withered hands. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and, and, and for this blessing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for our uh, church here, for those that are listening, and we ask that you would bless, Lord, those that are listening by the air or watching There may be some who are experiencing and have withered situations in their lives. It could be physical, it could be relational, it could be social, financial, or otherwise. We ask right now that you would call them forth, and we pray that you would begin to facilitate healing and deliverance for them right now. In the name of Jesus, forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. Help us to be the watch bearers on the walls of Zion. And we want, Lord, you not only to heal the withered parts of our own lives, but position us, Lord, as ministers of the gospel, as ministers of reconciliation to help facilitate healing in others. And we will not be careful to give you all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise for this in Jesus' name. Let all of God's people say, amen and amen.